Okay, we're going to look in this example at this vector valued function and specifically thinking about the space curve that's generated by this vector valued function. So, um, to start with, anytime you're thinking about anything to do with a vector valued function, one of the things you'd want to pay attention to is domain of the function. So, we talked about that a little bit in some prior videos. So, just thinking about the t values that would give us outputs here and if we would have any that we have any restrictions for. So we do not have any restrictions on this one. So for this one, t can be any real number. Uh, so the domain here is all real numbers. All right, in thinking about the space curve generated by this vector valued function, there are a couple of ways that you could think about doing that. Uh, and I'm actually going to use sort of a combination of really two different ideas here. One is that I'm going to think about the parametric equations for the curve that give the coordinates of the points. So this is a vector, and a vector is not the same as a point, but if we draw those vectors with their tail at the origin, then the terminal points of those vectors will be at the points with x coordinate given by this function. Sometimes people get the mistaken idea that what I have written down here is the same as what I'm writing down here. They're not the same, but they are related to each other. The first one is a vector, and the second one is a set of points. Okay, so these three equations generate the points that are on the space curve associated with this vector valued function. And so one way that I can do the space curve is by thinking about these equations and um, working with those. I can also plot some points. A computer, that's what a computer does when you ask it to graph a, a space curve, is it just plots a bunch of points really close together and then it looks like a connected curve. So we will plot a few points as well. Um, but if you're doing something by hand, that takes too long to plot too many points. And uh, we will use computers to graph some of them, but this is one that it will be helpful to you if you can think about what this curve looks like without needing the computer to do this. So by the time we get to an exam, uh, which is still a little ways away, uh, you should be able to look at this and pretty readily be able to describe what that curve looks like and think about what that curve looks like without needing to look at a computer graph. Um, so how do you get to there? Well, um, we're gonna kinda talk through it in a lot more detail here, but then we will focus on the same kind of example several more times throughout this chapter. And so you'll develop some more fluency with that. Um, when we looked at one before, I had uh, x involving a function of t and y involving a function of t, and z was just a constant in one of the previous examples we looked at. And we eliminated the parameter between the x and y because those involved t's. So we're going to use a kind of similar strategy here, but um, because they all involve t, I really can't eliminate the parameter from all of them at the same time. So I'm going to pick two of them to work with, and my general strategy is to pick the two that are the most complicated and work with those first, and then whatever is simpler is easier to kind of add on to what you've already thought about. Uh, so when I look at this, what I think about as being the more complicated ones would be the two with the trig functions in it. Um, in general, that's probably a good strategy with these anyway. If you have a couple of trig functions, you have some tools that you can use to relate those trig functions. So I would suggest doing that. So I'm going to focus on working with the x and the z equations to start with, and then we'll come back and layer in what we understand about what's happening with the y equation. So I would like to eliminate the parameter between these two equations. One thing that I sometimes see students try is they try to solve for t, in one of the equations and then substitute into the other equation. So for example, in this first equation, if you tried to solve for t in the first equation, uh, you would get t equals cosine inverse of x over 3. That's a bad idea. Um, so depending on how much you remember about inverse trig functions, uh, one thing that you should remember is that if you think about the possible values that can input to this cosine function here, uh, t can be any real number. Uh, at the instant when you use that inverse trig function, though, you have some restrictions. All of the inverse trig functions involve some restrictions so that you can actually define those functions. And so the t values that are going to output here, the t values that we would have here, would just be 0 to pi for the cosine inverse function. 
And so when you do that, you lose a significant, infinitely many much, infinitely, infinitely much, I guess, <laughs> of the graph uh, when you use that inverse trig function. So anytime you're doing anything that would restrict the values, that's probably not a good strategy. Sometimes maybe that's the only thing you can do, but that's not a good strategy in general. So instead of trying to solve for t in either of these functions, uh, the better strategy would be to use something else that you can use to eliminate the parameter and relate these. And you may remember this from working with two-dimensional parametric equations from Calculus 2 or prior class, or not. If not, that's okay, but um, sometimes this might have been an example that you might recognize what's going on here. Um, all right, so I'm going to start trying to solve for t, but stop before I would have this restriction here that would cause me some trouble. So in that first equation, if I just divide both sides by 3, so instead of doing this, in that first equation, if I just divide both sides of that equation by 3, I'll have x over 3 equals cosine t. And then if I do another step, I, I run into some trouble, so I'm not going to do any more steps. Uh, I'm going to do the same thing with this one. I'm going to divide both sides by 5. And then I'm going to stop, because if I use an inverse sine function, I again would run into some trouble there. So I have these two uh, relationships, and then instead of trying to use that inverse trig function, which causes trouble, what I instead would like to do is find a way to relate these two things to each other. And so with trig functions, you have lots of ways to relate trig functions. They're usually called trig identities, and you might not know lots of trig identities, but there should be one that you probably know, and it's the one you need here. So Pythagorean identity, most students know that one, uh, cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta equals 1. Or maybe you write it in some other order there, but cosine squared plus sine squared equals 1. All right, so I'm going to use that identity and substitute in place of the cosine theta or cosine t. I'm going to substitute in my x over 3, so I'm substituting into that identity. Don't forget the square. And then in place of the sine theta, or sine t, I'll substitute in z over 5. And then I get this equation, and I can simplify that a little bit if I want. x squared over 9 plus z squared over 25 equals 1. Okay, and uh, so you should recognize that as in the x and z direction, the equation of an ellipse. That's in standard form for an equation of an ellipse with center at 0, 0. And the x distance from the center will go plus or minus 3 units. And the z distance will go plus or minus 5 units. It's in that standard form. Uh, so x, let me write this, uh, negative 3 less than or equal to x less than or equal to 3 and negative 5 less than or equal to x, y, z, less than or equal to 5. Okay, so x will go from negative 3 to 3, and z will go from negative 5 to 5. All right, so that equation of that ellipse describes what's going on in the x and z directions for this curve. Now, if I think about this in three dimensions, not just two dimensions, you maybe would say to yourself, not that this is an ellipse, but that this is an elliptical cylinder. It's missing y, and so you should recognize that in three dimensions as an equation for a cylinder that extends in the y direction. y is unrestricted by this equation, so y could be anything from that equation. All right, so what I'm after here is a curve, not a cylinder, which would be a surface, but this cylinder is what our curve actually lies on. And so I'm going to sketch a rough sketch of that cylinder, not that that cylinder is really what we're after, but it's kind of a guide to help us get what our space curve actually looks like here. So I'm going to set up XYZ coordinate system here, and if I don't label, then we're going to assume our axes are oriented as usual. Um, so this would be our positive X direction, our positive Z direction, and our positive Y direction. And we're going to scale off some coordinates here. So uh, I need my x to go from negative 3 to 3, and my z to go from negative 5 to 5. 
And if I draw that ellipse, I'm going to use a different color here and draw it in kind of lightly. If I draw that ellipse, I don't want to draw this too dark because it's not really what I'm after. What I'm really after is this space curve, but this ellipse is going to help me uh, to see what this space curve looks like. All right, so here's my ellipse in the XZ plane. And remember, that would be kind of coming out at you, so it looks a little turned. Uh, all right, so there's the ellipse in the XZ plane. And then with missing Y in this equation, that would be a cylinder that extends in the Y direction forward and backward in the Y direction. So there's kind of a rough, dashed sketch of this tube, basically, elliptical shaped tube that extends on the Y axis. All right, so that's not our actual space curve, but it helps us to think about our space curve. Our curve is restricted to that shape, so our curve actually lies on that tube. So if you think about rolling up a sheet of paper in a tube and drawing a curve on that tube, there's lots of different ways that you could draw a curve on that tube that you would have there. Um, so those are all different space curves that would lie on that cylinder. Um, so now I need to think about how the curve lies on that cylinder. And that's what doing some plotting of points and kind of analyzing these functions individually can help us to think about here. Um, all right, so uh, I'm going to start with the Y and talk about that a little bit. And then we'll talk about the X and Z and maybe plot a couple points. Uh, our Y function increases as T increases. And in fact, it increases at a steady rate as t increases. This is a linear function in terms of y, or if you want to think about in terms of derivatives, uh, dy dt is 2. That's a constant rate of change. So what's going to happen with our curve in the y direction is that as t increases, y is going to increase. So we're going to go from the negative end of the y-axis toward the positive end of the y-axis. So our curve will be going that way. And y will be increasing at a steady rate with respect to t respect to t. So uh, we should expect that it, however it goes in the y direction, whatever part I draw, it's going to be consistent with whatever's going to happen over another interval of that curve. That's that y changing at a steady rate. Um, for x and z, uh, you might recognize, I said that you might recognize this from calculus 2 or maybe even a pre-calculus class if you worked with parametric equations. This is really a standard parameterization of an ellipse. I showed that here. And so maybe if you did this before in Calculus 2 or Pre-Calculus and recognize that, you would look at these two and say parameterization of an ellipse in the x and z direction and not need to go through this part to think about what does that ellipse look like. Um, and just kind of thinking about what's happening in the x and z direction because I have x here defined in terms of the cosine function and z determined in, defined in terms of the sine function, you should think back to trigonometry or pre-calculus when you first st started thinking about sine and cosine and a unit circle and how you think about sine and cosine going around the unit circle. So the t here is acting a lot like a theta would and thinking about x as we go around this circle uh, as t increases, say, from 0 to, say, 2 pi, x will make a complete cycle, right? That's a period of that cosine function. So this is going back to a lot of algebra, uh, pre-calculus, trigonometry ideas, thinking about inputs and outputs and periods of trig functions. So 0 to 2 pi will take the x's through a complete cycle. So I will go from uh, what happens at t equals 0, uh, cosine of 0 is 1, my x will be 3. So in an, in an interval of 0 to 2 pi uh, of t values, x will go from 3 to negative 3 and then back to 3 again. So in terms of my cylinder here, we'll go from forward 3 to backward 3 and back again. So on the x-axis, we're going to go back and forth. Uh, the z direction, when t is 0, uh, z will be 0. Uh, and then as t increases, we'll get to z equals 5 when t equals pi over 2. And then z will decrease to negative 5 and then back to 0 again. And so our z values will be going from 0 to 5 and then back down to negative 5 and then back up again. So we put all that together, the x is going forward and backwards but staying on this cylinder. 
the Z is going up and down, but staying on this cylinder, and Y increasing uh, as we go on this cylinder. You can maybe start to put that together and think about this curve. It's essentially like if you went around an ellipse, but in the direction of increasing Y, and so it's gonna wrap around and around that cylinder. All right, here's where plotting a few points can be helpful. I've talked through a few points that are relevant to plot, but let's go ahead and make a little chart here. You don't wanna plot a whole bunch. You just wanna plot a few points, uh, because if you're gonna plot a whole bunch, then you might as well have used a computer to do this. Um, all right, but a few that are pretty easy to do here. I mentioned that because these two trig functions have a period of two pi, Choosing values kind of strategically in the interval t equals 0 to 2 pi will give me a good sense of what this graph looks like. So I'm going to start with 0 and I'm going to end with 2 pi. And then I'm going to pick some kind of strategic choices in between 0 and 2 pi. Halfway between there, halfway between the beginning and the end of whatever the period of your trig functions might be. Halfway between there, uh, your functions will hit their other values. So going from minimums to maximums or back again and then halfway between those values. So pi over two, and then three pi over two. All right, so I'm just really gonna plot five points here uh, and think about the x, y, z coordinates. So I'm just putting in t equals zero to these equations to figure out my x, y, z coordinates. So when I put in t equals zero, I'll get three, zero, and zero. So I've got a point here on the front of my cylinder right here, three, zero, zero. Uh, t equals pi over two, so cosine of pi over two is zero, and then the y will be pi, two times pi over two will be pi, and my z will be five. Okay, so as I've increased, as t has increased from zero to pi over two, the curve will have gone from this point that is here at three, zero, zero, to a point that is um, zero in the x direction, so none, forward and backward, pi in the y direction, okay, so I'm gonna scale that off, that'll be about three, so I'm gonna scale that off, there's about three in the y direction and five in the z direction, so at the top of my cylinder here. So as we've increased from zero to pi over two, that's really only a quarter of the way through this period, right, a quarter of the way through that period, my curve has gone from being on the front side of the cylinder to being on the top of the cylinder here. So it's rotated a quarter of the way around this cylinder. Sometimes students want to plot a bunch of points and then go back and connect them. I usually find it easier to kind of plot them and connect them as I go because then I don't connect them all out of order. So I'm thinking about it's rotated around the cylinder from the front side of the cylinder to the top of the cylinder. All right, so there is just an estimate of what that looks like. All right, and then as we go through these other values, it'll do the other three quarters of the way rotation around that cylinder. And you know, if you really want a spectacular graph, maybe you use a computer to do this, it doesn't have to be perfect, but you should be able to think about kind of where it starts, where one cycle ends, which way does it go as it wraps around here? And so being able to do kind of a rough sketch like I've done here is something that you want to be able to do without necessarily needing to get that computer out. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and write these other points down and plot them, and we'll kind of look at the whole graph there. All right, so uh, when I put in pi, uh, let's see here, I'll get negative 3 and 2 pi and 0. When I put in 3 pi over 2, I will get 0, and 3 pi over 2 times 2 will be 3 pi, and 3 pi over 2 sine of 3 pi over 2 is negative 1, so that will be negative 5 there. And then at 2 pi, uh, again, the reason I went 0 to 2 pi is that's the period of these trig functions here. At 2 pi, we'll be back here at 3 for the x. My y, though, will be 4 pi, and my z will be 0. Okay, and so if you want to plot all of these points, you can, but just understanding that it's wrapping around this cylinder, so it will go around the back side of the cylinder and then come back to the front. I don't always plot all of the points. I'll usually plot one sort of at the beginning of the cycle, maybe one at the end of the cycle, and then maybe or maybe not some of these points in between. I'm going to go ahead and plot this one here uh, at the end. So i got to be a little careful about my scale here. I'm probably going to end up going off the screen here. So. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. I kind of shortened that up there. 
All right, so uh, four pi is around 12-ish, four times three-ish, around 12-ish in the y direction. So forward three over 12-ish and up zero. So here's a point approximately, not plotted perfectly, but approximately uh, where that first wrap around that cylinder would end. All right, so sometimes it's hard to draw these. Uh, but if you want to think about something like a slinky or a coil, and when you're looking at it kind of from an angle, how those might look, uh, you can think about that. Sometimes it looks like those coils actually loop behind each other before they come back around. I've drawn these a lot, and so my pictures probably look maybe a little better than yours might at the beginning, or maybe you're super artistic and yours will look even better than mine did. Uh, but what I've drawn there is one coil of this helix. I did dashed on the back side of the cylinder just to indicate that sort of on the back. And then uh, this part where it's wrapped back around. Now because the domain is all real numbers, y is really going to go from negative infinity to infinity. So if it would be important to indicate that on your graph, that it really continues beyond those, you can extend beyond one cycle. Because y increases at a steady rate, though, all of the other coils are going to be the same. Just like if you had a static spring, all those other coils are really the same distance apart from each other. Um, so really, one cycle is maybe enough for at least a, a sketch that you're doing by hand of something like this. So um, this kind of curve has a name. Uh, if this were on a circle, circular cylinder instead of an elliptical cylinder, we would call it a helix just like a helix for a DNA strand. Um, this one, because it's on an ellipse instead of on a cylinder, is technically not a helix. It's like a helix. Sometimes people might call it an elliptical helix to emphasize that it's on an ellipse and not tr technically a true helix. Uh, but we will recognize that we have graphs like this often when we have sort of a similar sort of situation. They might be oriented differently, different dimensions. We might have coils that stay the same distance apart, or we might have coils that get closer together or, or spread farther apart as we extend along the axes. So we'll look at many different examples like this. Um, but this is one that you will want to start to recognize because uh, it comes up so often, not only in this chapter, but in the other stuff that we will do. All right, so we're going to look at some more on the computer. We'll look at this one along with some other ones on the computer and look at how those look and how you might use a computer to graph slightly more complicated space curves in some future videos.